everyone. My name is Michelle Angelo Rocha, and I'm a PhD candidate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of South Florida. And today I'm here with a very special guest that we are part of a task force about human trafficking and human trafficking is connected to my research. And it's an honor to have her here with me so she can share a little bit about her story, but also about her knowledge. And um, so her name is Teresa Merriweather. Um, Teresa is an Illyria native who has dedicated nearly 20 years of her life to serving her community and advancing her education. However, prior to being able to embark on her professional life, Teresa's ambition were deterred by, by the horrific experience of being trapped in a sex trade. Her faith, personal ambitions, and perseverance instilled in her by her parents allow her to escape her trafficker and fulfill her educational and professional goals so she may help others. Miss Meriwether attained a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Sociology and a Master's of Science in Administration of Justice and Security. She is also a certified forest forensic evidence technician, and she is currently pursuing her doctorate of business administration. Teresa is a nation, national, na, nationally recognized trainer in issues affecting human trafficking, and she's seated on the Global Alliance Human Trafficking Task Force and relentlessly pursues her ambition of rescuing and restoring victims of human trafficking. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me today, Teresa. How Thank are you? you for having me. Good. Thank you. I'm well. Well, it's an honor to have you here. Could you tell, could you share a little bit about your story and what inspires you? Yes. So, you know, um, my background is like I come from a small city um, called known as Elyria, Ohio, and it's in the state of Ohio. Um, I've lived here in Ohio all of my life, basically, except for uh, for sometimes I was I was in transit, you know, I was transient, um, lived in a couple of different locations. Um, I, again, sit on the Global Alliance Human Trafficking Task Force. Yes. I am a survivor of sex trafficking. Um, years ago, I met a man and he caught me in a very vulnerable, let's say vulnerable place or vulnerable time in my life. And he later became my fiance. He actually was a pastor. And um, I ended up moving to another location with him. And, you know, I wasn't, let's say, drinking the milk. I was just drinking the milk. I wasn't eating the meat, you know, as a Christian, you know. Um, and so I should have never, ever moved in with him when I moved to a different location with him. Um, but I did, and that was one of the worst mistakes of my life, but in one of the most darkest times of my life, but now I had, it has gone, I've gone through the transformation process from darkness to light and the light has shone, shone, shone up upon me. And so when I moved in with him, the psychological abuse started, you know, um, I, you know, was in love with them and things, and I needed to get my medication filled um, in, you know, being transferring, going to a different location, another state, you know, I needed to get my medication because I suffered from PTSD as a child with anxiety disorder with the PTSD. So I would say affected by mental illness, but not mentally ill, because we don't use that word mentally ill, okay? Yeah. And, uh, in mental health, you, you don't use it, you use that you're affected by mental illness. So my diagnosis with is anxiety disorder with PTSD because of some trauma that happened to me in my childhood, if you will. So um, later on, I also became a parole officer, okay? So involved in law enforcement. And um, when I met him, I was taking what's called a medication known as Atarax, okay? In the capsule form. I used to take Xanax before I was a parole officer per requested need, so PRN, to help control my anxiety disorder. Sometimes when my symptoms would increase, you know, when there was things that uh, happened, you know, would trigger beyond my, um, beyond my control. And so the Xanax is scored, controlled substance is scored. So I mean, you can cut that in half, right? Yeah. So later on as a parole officer, when I got ready to be a parole officer, my physician told me, hey, Teresa, we're going to put you on Atarax. Atarax will, is, a, is a, like a, it's like an antihistamine in a capsule form. And so that if instead of taking the Xanax, because the Xanax would cause a delay in my reaction time if I get into a situation, especially where I got to use my weapon. OK, mm -hmm. so gave me the Atarax. So moving forward, I was, um, you know, later on after a parole officer, I got engaged. I told you to this pastor and. Um, and went to a location. And so he would hide my wallet so I couldn't get to the doctors. All right. So he took um, the Atarax and he would pull it apart. Right. And he put the benzos in there. Right. 
beyond besides that, I love sweet tea. All right. I love it. So he liked, he liked tea as well. So I just took like your milk jug, emptied it, the containers. I took two containers, emptied it with the milk, you know, or after he finished the milk, he and I, then we, I emptied the containers and I put um, with a marker, a U. So that stands for unsweetened. And then the S is sweetened tea, right? Yeah. So I like sweet tea. He didn't like sweet tea. So his was the U, the milk out. So sometimes a lot of times, well, sometimes at night I would fix my glass of sweet tea, you know? And when I fixed my glass of sweet tea, I didn't realize, but that's where he put the roof and all the roofies in my sweet tea. So, which is a date rape jug. All right. He told me, um, you know, he was married before with his ex-wife. He's like, Teresa, he's like, don't sleep in, you shouldn't, you know, it turns me off. Don't sleep in any clothes. He was like, you take your shower at night, which I do take my shower at night. And he's like, and you know, why don't you just sleep in a tower? Just sleep naked. So I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I'm gonna do whatever because I'm in love with you. Yeah. You know, you're my fiance. We're living together. We're going to be married. So what, you know, and he was older than me. So I noticed I drink the sweet tea. I get in bed and I notice I'm going out. I wake up the next morning. I don't know what's going on. Where am I at? I'm disoriented. Where am I at? It's like, what just happened? Waking up with semen in between my breasts down in my vaginal area, feeling violated, you know, and I just feel like a complete mess. So then, you know, he would come home and tell me like, did you take your meds? You know, so I take my Atarax, but the Atarax was the, he's put the benzos in it. So it's like making me really, really drowsy, you know, again, and like really, woo. So I gained an addiction to that drug. And then later on, as the abuse continued to take place, I noticed that he's got extra money. And then I can remember sometimes when I'm going in and out of consciousness, men on top of me, having sex with me, different. And I'm like, I'm not wake up. I'm like, I'm not crazy. You know, but that roof and all that roofy and stuff had me impaired. And then later on him telling me like, yeah, you know, admitting to what he was doing to me, you know? And so that was really scary for me. And then looking outside, we had, we had what's called an apartment home, bigger than an, bigger than an apartment, but smaller than a home. So it, it was very private though. And I see the cigarette butts lined up. So it's like the Johns, the ones who are smoking cigarettes are waiting to come in. Okay. There was a time that, um, got me as well is when one day, one weekend, he and I went to uh, a restaurant. Okay. I won't name the restaurant, but we went to a restaurant. He got, I, I, he would get, we go up pay and he would go and I go sit at the table with the food and he would go and get our drinks. Teresa, I'll get our drinks. So that particular time, that one that really stays in my mind and it still is a trigger for me sometimes, especially if I go to this particular restaurant, you know, which I try to still be able to eat that food, you know, because yeah. I remind myself with PTSD, I'm not there anymore, you know? And so I remember um, drinking my drink. I had lemonade that day, that time. And I went to the bath. I was like, oh, I'm not feeling good. So I went to the bathroom and I was just like, oh my God, I was in the bathroom for at least 30 minutes. And I'm like, man, he's not even going to come check on me. My, my uh, bowels would not quit moving. Okay. I had to even take toilet paper and in line my underwear. Because I'm like, I got, if I can get out of here, I've got to get home, you know, and I don't want to have an accident because it's just uncontrollable. And then I was thinking to myself sitting in there in the bathroom, I'm like, I need to call an, I need an ambulance. You know, like, I don't think I'm going to be able to get up. So I just stayed there and I uh, dealt with it. And then when I finally was able to get up and I go out there, I'm like, man, he had to, he didn't even come and check on me, but I knew the abuse was there, you know, like, don't even say anything really. And he was like, are you okay? I was like, not really. I said, I really don't feel good. He was like, we can go home. You know, he was really nasty. I mean, I was like, no, we can go ahead and do grocery shopping. Like, no, I'm going to take you home. When I got home, I remember getting undressed, but I woke up like, where am I at again? Wow. You know, what am I doing? You know, like what just happened? So that right there, you know, sometimes that trigger still, you know, when I go to that restaurant, it hits me. It's a trigger for me, but I have my tool belt, Michelle. What's your tool? Yeah, with my, my tool belt is like the things, uh, the coping mechanisms that my therapists have given me, you know, how to deal with the anxiety, how to deal with the PTSD, you know, how to get taken. Sometimes I take cold water or some ice and rub it on my wrist to let me know, you know, like, like, cause you disassociate and you feel like, you know, like with the panic attack, like what's going on that I'm here. It's okay, Teresa, you're here. You know, so I use the tools and I calm myself down. I, uh, I write down positive thoughts you know, to, to help negate the negative thoughts, you know? So every day for me, Michelle, is recovery. So when I tell people recovery is every day for victims of human trafficking, it's just, there's no specific time period on it. And I know recovery will be for the rest of my life. Yes. And like I said, I, I've said before, 
I worked in mental health before this happened to me. I'm an adult survivor. This happened to me. I have background in law enforcement. You got me, you know? And it's like, I tell people that it's, you know, I wanted to commit suicide. Like this was very shameful. I felt guilty. Like this was all my fault. You're so smart, Teresa, but look at what happened to you, you know? And so I tell people that there's times when I go to sleep at night and I cry myself to sleep because I got to deal with a trigger, you know? Mm -hmm. And so being a believer in God, I just talk to him, help me walk through this, help walk me through this God. Mm -hmm. And so I do that, you know, and I'm sorry, but because sometimes I still get emotional because it's like, I'm not talking about other victim story. This is me. That's your story. Yeah. This happened to me, you know? I know. Yeah. You, oh, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Uh I really, um, I really am so thankful because through your life, so many people can listen to that. And you are sharing, that's when you are telling the story. And uh, one thing during my research, when I was interviewing victims of human trafficking, they were, they were telling me that, and like you have, you were in the field and how many women today, a lot of, sometimes we don't, they don't see themselves as a victim of trafficking. And sometimes they are, if they are there because they are so attached to, to their, to, to, to the trafficker. And, um, and, but don't, uh, don't feel like when I'm listening to your story, don't feel um, embarrassed because your story is today. I see your story. And since the first time I met you was you inspired, like how, just how you talk and your passion. And, Mm -hmm. and I just feel like, I just thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. And so I'll go a little bit more when you said, you know, what we're referring to is a trauma bond being attached to them. That's a trauma bond. That's the usage, the word in mental health, you know? And like, think about like police officers. There's some police officers that that we know, but they're not going to come out and tell it that they deal with domestic violence, right? So it's the same thing you think about, you know? Um, And look at me having a background in law enforcement. And I know when, when I talked to my psychiatrist and she helped detox me, you know, I went cold turkey, Michelle. You know, I'm like, just help me get these drugs out of my system. And so you're jonesing or, you know, you have the urge for it to the drug because it's going to make you feel a little bit better, you know, but it's like, it's a coping mechanism so that you don't have to face the reality, the reality of what just happened to me. What have I been through? You know? And so I told my psychiatrist and she told me, Teresa, your life is not spinning on a dime. Like I tell everyone in my interviews, that's what I held on to. She said, God is going to use you. And she was a Christian and she is a Christian. I'm sorry. You know? And so she would tell me, Teresa, I need you to be journaling. I need you to journal, she says, because this is like a, what happened to you is a lifetime movie. Like, you can she write said, a book, you can exactly. like share, and, you can inspire some women. Yay. Yeah, and I, and I am, Michelle. Um, the first one is called The Good Old Pastor, the second one is Caught in Traffic. So it's like I'm finishing up my books, you know, so that they can be used to tell the story, not for just because of me, but it's to help other people and to know that you're not alone, you know. And so for me, I would tell my psychiatrist when she told me you need to be writing and journaling and, you know, write a book, like you said, and, you know, you need to do a lifetime movie. I tell her if God will heal me, I promise to do it. And it's so like in the last six months, a lot of people see like, where does this woman get all this passion for, you know, with, vi- with victims of human trafficking and training and stuff? Well, the, I was ashamed to tell it. Like I'd have other survivors on my staff like, hey, you know, go ahead and tell your story. But here I am. I w- wasn't willing to tell mine you know, but I'm empowering other people. That's a true leader to move forward ahead. Right. Yeah. So then it's like, well, I put a bandaid on my, my wound. I put a bandaid on my wound and it's like, you know, whenever you get wounded and stuff in your doctor, you go to the doctors and stuff. They tell you like, after so long, you got to take the bandaid off so it can completely heal. Right. Yeah. So then it's like with me, with God, like, I don't want to take this bandaid off. Like, God, please. I don't want to like, this is my protection. You know, I don't, I don't want to tell my story because you know, underneath this bandaid is a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. And I don't know if I'm ready, you know? And it's like, well, step by step, he led me, Teresa is time. Mm -hmm. And so I now tell my story, you know? And like the other victims that I work with, they're like, we knew it, you know, we knew it, you know? But it's just like, when I tell people we're victims of human trafficking, look beneath the surface, read the nonverbal communication that is presented with us, you know? And we're going to tell them, have a willing heart, and to put down the pen when you're interviewing and listen, I'm gonna tell you the story. Yes. Especially when we're ready, you know? And with 
with with human trafficking victims like look at me you have to peel back the layers like an onion you got to treat my mental illness i tell people if a victim has not if the victim wasn't affected by mental illness before going into the life of trafficking they're going to come out affected by mental illness right so yes. you're going to have the anxiety and then look at me i had the anxiety now on top of that i got the depression because of that dark period and trying to handle you know those thoughts of you know you're 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 stupid you know versus you know Teresa you went through that for a reason you're going to save lives you know look at it in a more positive effect you know so you're it's really you go through a lot of depression and then you can't control the anxiety and those thoughts so that make you even more depressed so I'm dealing with anxiety and depression both of these two uh wolves in my in, I'm feeding in my head you know and so then comes along people that I would say like the lions because the lion can eat the wolf right yeah the, wolf. the lions are the people who were surrounded by me helping me on the road to recover. You can do this, Teresa, you can do it. And so a lot of them, because I'm a Christian, yeah, they fed me the word, but you got to remember that I had a problem with God and you know, I have a problem with God because this man was a pastor. You know, this was, a, this was a false prophet. God, why me? So with that being said, I had a problem with God. Why me? Why me? Why me? Why me, God? But now I look back over my life, Michelle, and I understand why, right? And yeah. so now with me, I, there was a, you know, I, let me go, let me go into a little religion for you. Cause this is me. Right. Oh yeah, sure. And Isaiah six, eight, right. Isaiah six, eight in the Bible, it says that Isaiah, that, that he heard the voice of the Lord saying, and whom shall I send to go for us? Isaiah raised his hand and said, here am I send me. So for me, that's my mission. He's equipped me. Like I tell people, he doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies. Qualifies those that he calls. So look at me. You can't just say that I'm a human trafficking expert due to my acad my my academia, right? Yeah, Background. Yeah, life I live life experience, and I tell people you can't tell me about human trafficking. I was there. Look at the CSI background with me. I was on the scene. <laughs> you know, I have the evidence to prove. Look, this I'm a physical being. This happened to me, but now I'm happy that even sharing today with you is part of my healing process. It empowers me. It helps me, you know, to move, to move and conti continue going forward, you know? And I, I look, I, how do I put it to you? Look, I put behind me the former things, right? Yeah. As I put, as I push forward in the, uh, with the mark of the prize, which is the, my higher calling, what is my calling? And it's to save lives. I know. No, I, you, you are sharing so much in, in a few minutes because we are here we're talking about mental health. And mm -hmm. one thing that the Global Alliance that we are always, we have also a task force in this organization um, that um, we all talk about um, mental health and the stigmas of connected to mental health. And we should talk about this too later on, but also about the feeling of a lot of women being victims of gender by violence or being victims of tra human trafficking or sexual exploitation, labor exploitation. Sometimes we feel, and sometimes even this happened to me too. I was victim of gender-based violence. And mm -hmm. for many years, I was embarrassed of my story of embarrassed of, no, because Michelle is this a strong woman, but, and this happened to me too. And I was like, I, for many years, it goes, like you said, it took years for me to be able to, to be able to share my story and say like, I, I'm not, instead of being embarrassed because, oh, you are always talk about women empowerment and everything, but accepting ourselves with, with what happened to us, take a while, it took like so many years for me to, to be able to share my story and say like, my story can help another woman, can help another teenager that's mm -hmm. going through this right now, because this happened to me too. So, um, when I'm listening to you, I'm listening the same feelings that you also felt the same, the same, also how the system is created to make us women to feel ashamed of going through those, that, through this, those experiences. Sometimes we end up being quiet and not seeking for help or not sharing our stories because of the stigmas of being a victim of gender violence or human trafficking. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, could you share a little bit more about um, about your work? Like, so you have all this experience. Could you share a little bit more about your work and yeah. training because you do an amazing job. Could you share a little bit more about your work? 
Yeah, of course. So um, in 2016, I well, December of 2016, I successfully completed a fellowship in human trafficking out of Washington, D.C. Um, I was one of maybe 22 in the third round or something that was able to um, receive a fellowship. And so I was a fellow and I was the only person that did it, did the fellow that did theirs in human trafficking. Wow. So I successfully completed, um, and I know other people during that did not complete their fellowship successfully, right? They failed it. So I successfully completed my uh, fellowship in human trafficking out of Washington, D.C. with an organization known as the Woodson Center, all right? Um, I completed in December of 2016. Uh, with my training program, I have developed simulations, or I say role plays, Okay. Where, let's say for the first one that come for my audience, well, participants in my human trafficking awareness training, program when they come through the first thing you're going to do what's going to happen is you're going to receive a pre-assessment okay so okay. i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to look at your uh look at test your knowledge with human trafficking period so i'll give you a brief um pre-assessment then afterwards most people fail my pre-assessment oh, then really? afterwards, yeah, afterwards you go undergo um the actual training program and with in the actual training program involves um, you go into the simulations, which I have on Zoom platform or the role plays in person, right? Where you're going to see me. The first role play is I play the role of a, of, a, of a trafficker, right? And I face a real estate agent in the in the role play. And I'm trying to purchase this house for trafficking. But the real estate agent doesn't realize it, all right? So I show the indicators of what you're looking for if a trafficker or traffickers come to, a real, to an open house, to a house that's on the market with the real estate agent in there during the open house, what it looks like and the questions and some indicators that this is a little bit kind of different from regular people coming in, right? So I'll yeah. show you indicators that this may house this, they may be purchasing this house for trafficking. Then I show you also another role play, which is, you know, these kids that are playing these PS4 games with the, you know, with the microphone coming yeah. around, they're playing with people from all over, right? Yeah. I show you, it looks like how easy it is to infiltrate in as a trafficker to start grooming the child or youth that's playing against you in this, in, on the, on the PS4 game. All right. At any given time, Michelle, with these PS4 games and social media and stuff, there's at any given time, over 50,000 pedophiles that they're on there, Michelle. And they're not on there just to play the game. They're in there lurking to separate with the sole purpose of separating these youth or children from their families. Yes. So I show that. Okay. Then I'll show you what it looks like you go through another simulation with a um, hair salon, cosmetologist, all right? Okay. In the state of Ohio, um, in approximately 2016, the year 2016, the governor during that time was Governor Kasich. And part of his initiative with the human trafficking, combating human trafficking in the state of Ohio, he required that all licensed cosmetologists had to have continual education in human trafficking awareness in order to renew or obtain their license, right? Yes. So, so I went to different salons throughout Ohio. I go in, then I would build or uh, build their safety pro safety plan in with the security of so should a trafficker or traffickers enter that establishment, that hair salon with the new recruits, those victims during the transformation process, how to recognize them and how to re how to separate the victim or victims from the traffickers and get help without compromising the security of that entire establishment and those that victim or victims that the trafficker has with them, all right? Yes. So I show you what it looks like, the signs when they come through a hair salon, okay? What you're looking for. Then I also show you juvenile delinquent in one of the role plays, juvenile delinquent that keeps going on and going on and off probation, catching offenses, okay? Catching, and so with the case, I show you that Probation officers need to be trained and I show you what you're looking for during the interviewing process to detect whether or not this juvenile delinquent is involved in human is involved in human trafficking is a is a human trafficking victim. I have an identical twin sister. I have braces. Oh, really? So be, yeah. Hopefully I'll be getting these off soon. I've had them long enough. But my identical twin sister, her name is Tilly. She was a juvenile probation officer for over 10 years in a city. The big city closest to us is about 30 minutes away from Elyria called Cleve, known as Cleveland, Ohio. She have a lot of, let's uh, say, uh, a big caseload with high risk juveniles, right? That are part of gang affiliations, committing felony offenses, okay? So my twin sister, I trained her on human trafficking and what she's looking for. 
My training led to her while she was a juvenile probation officer. It led to her paying attention to a young youth that was a delinquent on her caseload that she noticed kept going on and off probation. But this youth, uh, my, this youth was involved later on. My twin sister was able to prove she's involved in a sex trafficking operation. She was a victim. My twin sister would have her locked up, reprimanded to the detention home, detention facility. She would go, be in there recruiting new girls. So when they get out. Wow. So I remember the, the case in Cleveland. Remember the case of Cleveland that the, the two or three girls, I don't remember exactly the name and how many they were in the, in the house. Uh, I don't know if you remember, it was a few, a few years ago. Yeah, but... yeah, the, um, yeah, Michelle Knight, I believe her name, Amanda, Amanda Berry. Wow, and, I never um, forgot this case. Gina De Jesus, yeah, with, with Ariel Castro. Our, yeah, that was in Cleveland, yeah. So when we look at that, Michelle, you know, us being on the Global Alliance Human Trafficking Task Force, right? Yes. So we also want to look at this. So those young ladies, right, he did not bring in other people. They weren't sold. He used them for his own, uh, his own, you know, gain or whatever, his own reason, okay? They weren't sold. So if you put, let's look, if we put survivors of human trafficking, let's say myself or other people on the platform, say um, we're all sitting together and we're doing a panel discussion. Yeah. One of us, survivors of sex trafficking may say, hey, you weren't sold though. We were sold. There was a commodity on our on our, on our our head, right? Yes. So when we look at human trafficking, you know, on the Global Alliance Human Trafficking Task Force, we, we got to look a little bit with that gray area, right? They were not sold, but we were sold. So, you know, they were held in captivity, just like we are, right? But what is it? There's a distinction looking at that commodity. So there's something that we have to look at with the Global Alliance Human Trafficking Task Force and stuff about that when we look at the definition with human trafficking, right? And I know with the Ohio Revised Code, you know, definitely, you know, you're looking at where they, you know, abducted, kidnapped, those different elements of that crime are there. But we got to look into that a little bit more because it's a gray area. Would you agree? Could you share a little bit more about how is this conversation when you are with the, the victims? First, there is a difference because in my research, when I, I talked to the survivors, they told me that there is a difference between victim and survivor. And especially when you are seeking for, for help, especially from the government. So there is a distinction between victim of and survivor. Could, do you know how to, to explain this difference? Especially, for, for example, one of the, the, the survivors that she told me, she, she told me that sometimes the, the victim, sometimes the victim is someone who is, is still, because how sometimes the government, how the policies are created, sometimes when they see a survivor, is someone who already went through the process and is already recovering, it doesn't need any help. And the victim now is the victim is someone who is still needs help and the support. Right. So let's look at this. So the victim. So if we're doing an active investigation, right? So we 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 got some people that came came forth and said, "Hey, this is a sex. This person. These are the these are the offenders. It looks like in this uh, in this sex trafficking operation. With that with that offender, the trafficker, right? Or the traffickers, they have victims. Okay. Those victims, you're in captivity. So I would say those are victims. Those are, looks like the victims of human trafficking. So then once they're rescued, right? Once we get them on the road to recover the re rescue, you would say, I survived. I'm a survivor of this, right? So I would say with looking at the victim to survivor, the victim is the one that's still in it, right? And those are the identified beings that is a part of this sex trafficking operation, right? But then once we rescue them, then they survive. These are survivors. I survived what happened to me. You know, just like with domestic violence, I've been through that. I survived. I was a victim. And, you know, we had to look at, too, a lot of times, even myself, I did not want to identify myself while I was being uh, being trafficked as a victim, a victim, because I didn't realize, like, this is human trafficking. Yeah. He's, you know, in the component underneath the human trafficking, sex trafficking specifically, like, I'm a victim, too. Like, and so when I got out of the, out of the life of what he did to me, it's like, oh, my God. I was a victim of that. But now I turn from victim to guess what? I'm a survivor. I survived to tell the story of the victim with the, with the victimization. Does that make sense? Makes sense. But one thing that they were telling me is how the system, how the government sometimes sees the victim, like the survivor sometimes. No, you already, for example, this woman, she, the trafficker, he used to give her alcohol. 
So her, instead of giving water, he used to give her alcohol. So she became an alcoholic, right? She mm -hmm. became addicted to alcohol. Mm -hmm. And she was saying that even though she became a survivor, she still needed the help of mental health uh, service. She really needed all those services, but sometimes because she was a long time ago, she was the victim mm -hmm. and she was already going through recover. The system didn't see her anymore as someone who needed support. And she said, like, even when I'm stressed, when I am stressed, sometimes my body craves for the alcohol. And even though and, and even though I'm an uh, activist right now and try to help another woman, mm -hmm. at the same time, I don't have the economic conditions still to pay for a uh, treatment. So I need they still need from the government support. Right. And so you need still, okay, we're a victim, but once we get rescued and stuff and we get, hey, with the mental health, hey, this is with the proper verbiage is, hey, I got a client that's a survivor of human trafficking, right? So then when you, with that survivor, we need all the resources that are attached with victims of human trafficking, you know, per se, the victimization. Well, what occurs, what do you need to treat us for? Because that happened to us, that, excuse me, what do we need um, treated? as far as the treatment for people who were victims of human trafficking, right? Yes. I'm a survivor. We survived with the mental health, but let's talk about the things that had the trauma that, that occurred during that victimization, which led to these symptoms, right? So one of the symptoms may be, I want to go back and self-medicate when I have a trigger. I don't want to face this, right? Reality of what happened to me. So I need services. This survivor needs services to help with that drug addiction or that alcohol addiction or both. Cause it could be, you know, both. So then I need those services. I also need cognitive behavioral therapy, possibly, or and I need to, or I need to speak with someone that is trained in what's called trauma-informed care. They're certified, right? So underneath human trafficking, the government needs the services for the survivor need to match to be cognitive have to be matched to people who are take care of victims of human trafficking. They need to meet these qualifications. You know what I mean? Have the you know CBT therapist certified with you know what they have the background and training with that. Kind, uh, that's cognitive behavioral CBT, then the uh, they need to be trauma-informed care certification, right? Yes. Also, they need to be aware of what's called multicultural competency. Yes. I may yes. not work that's with- That's my thing. Yeah, like you, Latino, correct? Yeah. You may not want to work with me as a Black American. And you would think like, you're a minority. And I would think, and you would think like, I would think like, you're a minority just like me. No, there is the cultural difference. And that culture, you want someone that speaks your language and that knows your culture, okay? And you may want to work with someone that looks like you. And so therefore, if they don't have that there, that 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 that, that ability to be able to have uh, someone that looks like you and, you know, from your culture for to get you on the road to recovery, that's a problem. Because that, the problem meaning that's going to be a barrier to getting you on the road to recovery. Because guess what I'm going to do possibly? I'm going to go back into the light, go back out in the streets get back to drinking or use or using drugs or both dealing with this trauma because I don't have the proper resources to help me. Okay. This is so, huge. That that's sorry. I'm interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Go, go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah. Multicultural competency. You know, you need to understand that, you know, I've heard of one lady uh, who was a victim, became a survivor going to a, a mental health agency and her therapist said you were trafficked. Really? Like, wow. You know, and a lot of people, the stigma attached to it is the fact that people think it's just minorities that are trafficked. OK, well, we're more vulnerable because, like I tell you, as a black American, there's a there's a, um, an analogy that says that we were born with with shovels right in our hands to dig our own graves. For me, I put that shovel down. I ain't digging no grave. I'm going to walk. I'm going to move forward. Right. Yeah. So, you know, with us, we require especially minorities. Research shows that a minority would rather work and once does well working with another minority. Whereas like with Caucasians, they'll work with anyone. Okay. But with minority to minority. So if, if I request Michelle, I would like to meet with someone that looks like me from my culture. Can you provide that to me? No. Okay. Is there anyone here that can, that, that's a minority that can work with me? No, but you're going to be, you're going to have to work with me, Teresa, because you know, I'm it for your resources. Uh -uh, right there. I'm looking at a violation with regards with social, with, with your social work licensure, because with ethics, this isn't right. Yes. You know, so we need, um, we need to make sure we can make sure these, that these behavior healthcare organizations who are especially getting funding for victims of trauma, especially like with human trafficking, you know, with a, a horrific heinous crime as human trafficking, you need to make sure that your mental health agency is equipped 
with people that are, that are multicultural that so that if when that victim that gets that gets rescued and comes there they can get the services they need if they request someone that looks like them to get them on the road to recovery so that's one barrier that's going to be eliminated got it yeah no that's huge what you're saying because another when i was doing my research i was interviewing immigrants so mm-hmm. my focus was on immigrant community especially in the latinx community and um they were telling me this woman she she told me she, she was uh she was not latinx she was uh I forgot now um, the name of the country where she was, um, but uh, she told me like, when you are, when you are interview someone, for example, law enforcement, especially a lot of times the law enforcement see because I can't speak the language or because I have a strong accent, I have a, my cultural barriers, I'm already with so many traumas. So when you 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 someone comes to ask me uh, ask me questions, sometimes you need to understand first. A lot of things, a lot of times I heard that sometimes the law enforcement, sometimes they don't see a victim of human trafficking, especially if it's undocumented, if it fit all the, all the stereotypes of what is known a victim, and they end up treating this woman or this person as a, as a criminal instead of a victim because they can't understand, they can't understand the language of this person. They don't stop to listen to their stories. And at the same time, they don't have this multicultural training to, to understand. And another thing they told me is a lot of times, sometimes even the translators, just because you know how to speak Portuguese or Spanish, doesn't mean you understand my culture, doesn't understand that you need to have small people, professionals that understand the culture of the victims because sometimes for example this woman she she said sometimes how you they will ask me questions i don't feel comfortable because that's rooted in my culture in my culture we are not we didn't learn how to speak openly like like this about sex so you are asking me a question you want me to answer you but i'm not prepared like i can't talk to you about this i can't answer you because because of my culture of how I grew up. So you need to understand And Sometimes they saw her as a criminal or saw her with someone who didn't want to help. So could you, sh- so sh- they need of more, tr- more, much more people trained in, in cultural, especially in the United States, there are so much diversity. There is a need of more professionals that are trained. Yeah, and like, I, if I would say like my back, background with mental health, I worked on what's called an African-centric team. And the organization that I worked for, we were the leading, at one point, we were the leading uh, behavioral health care organization in Northeast Ohio, all right? And on that African-centric team, you know, I trained law enforcement. If a person comes that's in crisis, that you go out and uh, you go to a scene that's in a, the mental health crisis, they're in, they're in crisis, if they look like me, African-American, how to deal with them, how to, let's say, infiltrate in and get comfortable with them to help de-escalate them. Because the first thing that me as a as a black American, we're scared of the police because we're looking at the thing. So when we look at like with my culture, you know, and I trained with African centric, I trained many law enforcement officers on crisis intervention techniques and how to de- de- de-escalate situations. Because as a black American, a lot of us right now with, you know, the times and the things that have happened to us um, with the excessive force cases and things, we're afraid of the police, right? So I've really trained- awesome what's happening now. Yeah. Yeah, I trained on how to approach us, you know, how to how to come to some type of happy medium. So it's Where? like um also when we look at with human trafficking, people think that it's just males that traffic that are involved in trafficking. 43% of traffickers are females, Michelle. Wow. wow. You look at that because think about it. Some parents traffic their kids for drugs. That uh, pay- yes. females, right? Mothers. Mother. They're on drugs. We have like in Ohio, the big opiate epidemic, you know? Like, do you think that these kids are not being affected? Yeah. So then sometimes you'll find some, some things in the newspaper where there were some kids in the car where the parents overdosed. That children's service agency needs to go ahead and interview those kids. How are the parents getting the drugs? Or the parent getting the drugs? I have a, a woman who, her mom, she her mom trafficked her as a kid for, for crack cocaine. And then this woman ends up having six different children by six different fathers. She ends up going to prison, having three different prison numbers. She ends up on crack cocaine herself, you know, because of what happened to her when she was younger by her, by her mother. 
and children's services didn't get her the help that she need. One of the things is this, Michelle, how many children's service agencies are properly trained in human trafficking? When I say properly, I use the word trained. There's okay. a difference between difference between a presentation on human trafficking. I watched a training and it was like videos, like a webinars, just like where you move one slide to another. Like that's not, not, not how you train. That's not no. an official. Yeah, but think about this, Michelle. How many organizations who are putting on saying trainings will really are presentations because are getting a lot of money off of this because people are taking advantage of the need for providing education on human trafficking and also taking advantage of the need of servicing victims of human trafficking, right? I'm gonna go a little bit further here. Yeah, I so love I'm it. Gonna go, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna go a little bit further here. So there's P, there's a difference because with the presentation, the cost is less than the actual training. When you look at the training, look at me. I got you. I give you a pre-assessment, a post-assessment, and a training evaluation to measure the effectiveness of my training. Okay. Okay. We also look at when you're servicing victims of human trafficking. One thing that makes me can make me more. One thing, if you want to know, to make me more upset is when I have a domestic violence shelter housing victims of human trafficking, human trafficking victims and or survivors and domestic violence survivors or we say victims okay they're they're, they're both fruits right but these are two different fruits this is an mm -hmm. apple and an orange right yes and different and guess what you those are those are two different pods of uh of grant money all right so how do you separate that and how do you separate if you get me in let's say a, a shelter and i'm a just came out of the life of trafficking and you get me in there with a domestic violence victim and she's telling her story or whatever and i'm gonna sit there and say well at least you weren't sold you know what I mean? This is why at least you weren't sold one person. At least you know how many men, you know, had sex with you. At least you weren't sold. So then you run into problems with that. And then when you have people that are providing education on human trafficking that don't know what they're doing or what they're talking about, reading from a PowerPoint presentation, you know, and like I tell people, for me, you can't tell me about human trafficking. I have the background with the academia, correct? Yes. Then when we look at, let me go, let me go back to that background a little bit for you, Michelle. I got okay. to make, take, take your well, audience, take, take your audience to class, right? You hear oh, that bell? That's you hear that bell? We're you hear that bell, Michelle? We're here to educate. <laughs> yeah. You hear that bell? I always, always say class is in session. Let's go backwards. Okay. So I got the degree in sociology, criminology. That's my undergrad. When we look at sociology, we're looking at studying groups of people, you know, their behavior in groups, right? People in, in groups, their behavior. Then when I look at criminology, the study of criminals, human trafficking is what? Organized crime. A lot of time, organized crime, right? Yeah. There's masterminds behind, this is a big business. Yeah. Then you look at the my master's in the administration of justice and security. Human trafficking is one of the worst horrific forms of injustice there is, all right? So then the security, I know how to keep myself safe and keep victims safe as I rescue. And then also I know how to keep an establishment as far as, far as a safe house safe, all right? So with those victims in there so that we can keep them safe so that a lot of them, they're gonna be used also for the prosecution, all right? For that courtroom, for that trafficker who, you know, who uh, alleged or have committed the offense against them. So the next thing happens is look at the forensic, let's say forensic evidence technician certification I carry or crime scene technician certification, interchangeable, right? I'm, I'm able to advocate on behalf of that victim to get what? That trafficker, he, get him found guilty, get that conviction, get him sentenced to get put away so that you don't do commit this crime against others, right? Yes. Then with my doctorate in business administration, human trafficking is a multi, oh, a multi-billion dollar criminal industry. It's a business. But on the other side, running a training program is a business, right? So we put all this together. So then when you look at what the education with me, I did not only a survivor, because you can't tell me about human trafficking, I lived it, right? But also let's look at the fact that I did a fellowship and successfully completed that fellowship in human trafficking. So who, who wants to come to the table with me and discuss human trafficking? You know what I'm saying? So when I go to different events and I just had a, an event that I went to a couple of weeks ago, the lady sitting up there, I noticed when I walked in, I walked in a little bit late. So when I go in, the lady gets a little nervous. I noticed her body language changes. She's a little nervous. I didn't know her, but she knew me. So I'm sitting there and I listen to her to give out these false information and stuff. She she just refused to uh, to acknowledge me. So because I had the mic, I asked for the microphone to be held, given to me so that I can ask her some questions. And she says she's gonna she's not gonna answer questions until after the, after she's done presenting. Okay. When she was done, I asked her questions regarding human trafficking. She could not answer. So here I am. You're the problem with human trafficking. Fraudulent information. Don't know what you're talking about. Who's paying you? How much money are you getting paid for this? You know, because this is wrong. You're exploit. You're using this to exploit us even more. Would I? Would that be correct?
Yes, I went to that to these few task forces uh, before um, when I was doing my research a uh, few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I saw so many people in those meetings mm -hmm. and I noticed that, well, they were all talking. I saw all, they were all talking about human trafficking, but mm -hmm. I didn't see the people who were experienced there. They were talking, making decisions, decisions in policies, decisions in, in, in next steps. Mm -hmm. And now is the language that they use, the modern slavery, like how they use the language was just like, well, uh, something very, just like annoying me. I don't know if that's a proper way to say, but I was just yeah. annoyed how those organizations here in the state, the state of Florida, how they were mm -hmm. talking about human trafficking. And I said like, where is the immigrant victim of, of human trafficking? Where mm -hmm. is the other people who are victims of human trafficking? Why they're not, they not here making decisions? They are yeah. not here, especially with policies, decisions. They, where are they? We are talking about them, but they're not here to represent themselves and tell their stories. Right. And, you know, Michelle, if I may add, like, people don't know, but listen, in Nigeria, I've got, I've done a case building course, right? So, you know, of course, their, their laws are different than, you know, our country, you know? And so to help my, my, my case building course is to help the prosecutorial teams over there to build the cases, right? For the courtrooms. So when I look at Africa, I'm African-American or I say Black American, but hey, Africa's the motherland right? When we look back with slavery. So then, okay, you want to say human trafficking, right? You want to use that word modern day slavery? I train also in Africa. Going back to the mother, I know slavery, right? Yeah. You have people that sit up here and they don't know what they're doing or talking about, but why don't you listen to the victims and yes. survivors, you know what I mean? That just came out or been on the road to recur. They're going to tell you the needs. We, there's different, there, we all have a different experience with yeah. being in the life of trafficking. I was trafficked by my fiance, right? But it was still human trafficking, sex trafficking. Yeah. He impaired me. He let, brought the brought the Johns in, got paid. I was held in captivity. I can't go nowhere. What am I gonna do? I got these drugs in my system. Who's going to believe me? You know, I'm a former. He got the guns in here. I'm a former law enforcement, but he got me psychologically. Okay, so then psychologically, is the, that's the worst place that you can be is in your head. You know, when they get you in your head to brainwash you. You know, so then we look at. The victims who, let's say that are that the children who are or youth, that a youth experience is going to be different possibly because, look, they've been groomed on, let's say, social media. Then they believe that this guy is their, you know, boyfriend. And the next thing, they're being trafficked in different locations as far as they're being sold in different from state to state. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. In transit, going from place to place. So they got a different experience to tell. You got, when you talk about immigrants, let's talk about this, Michelle. Let's talk about some of these. I'm just going to use this term for now non-native nail salons yes. a lot of times when i went to get my nails done and i've been in non-native nail salons to get my nails done or my pedicure you see before covid wearing um the the nail techs wearing the um the mask sometimes sometimes i say all non-native nail salons are involved in it but sometimes that that the ones who are involved in labor trafficking they're using the, the mask help to disguise that labor trafficking victim that's servicing you that you come in and get your nails done what about them? They've been given a false promise. Let's say everybody wants to come to the United States, the land of the milk and honey, right? Yeah. So guess what? The trafficker then goes ahead, recruits them from over there. Hey, gives them the false promises. I'm going to get you your passport. You know, I'm going to pay for your airfare. You give you a better life. They get over here to the United States. It's a whole nother story. Yeah. Then they take their passports from them, all identifying documents or information regarding them. You're getting ready to work. You're getting ready to pay off a debt that you could never repay. I house you. I paid for those passports. I paid for that flight. I'm, I've got your clothing. I'm taking you back and forth to work in this nail, you know, nail salon and stuff. Guess what? They can't tell us exactly what's going on with them because there's a language barrier. Yes. One. And then they're scared. They're in a foreign country. They're nervous. They're scared. So what about them? There are and so many their immigration status so many things is in one and sometimes for example because this person is undocumented this person is going to be quiet because he's not going to seek for help because he's also afraid of so many other reasons and yes uh you are here's, some, here's something else for you to talk about when we talk about immigration you ready yeah. so we have natural disasters hurricanes let's say tornadoes what happens when these children get displaced from what their parents would not like hurricane katrina or something that's where our traffickers take advantage of their opportunists get them children 
So guess what? A parent may be somewhere thinking their child is deceased from that net and being displaced, you know, and separated from them. And guess what? No, they're involved with trafficking. Yes. Now the trafficker took advantage, grabbed them up. You know, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you find your mom and dad. No, nah, they get them in another location, get them out of state where that get, get them to safety from that natural disaster or whatever. Now that, that kid goes undocumented stuff. Where's that kid helping killed in captivity? What's going to happen to that kid? This is their life. I saw, I was watching this webinar that I never forgot that story. It was an indigenous little boy, a Mexican little boy, indigenous, where he couldn't, he, his native language was not Spanish, even though he was from Mexico. And because the people are not trained properly, he was on the border. And he was, because he couldn't speak in Spanish, he couldn't mm -hmm. translate, he couldn't answer the law enforcement. They end up being consider like the criminal as uh, someone who was the criminal because because he couldn't answer like because everything what he was saying he was saying see 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 because people they were expecting him to speak spanish and he right his first language is not spanish mm -hmm. yeah so what do you do in cases like that like we have a lot of work to do and like a lot of people think that oh this only happens over in those other foreign countries no it happens right here in the united states Oh, yeah. No. And then everybody, you know, when everybody's sitting here like, oh, gosh, now everything's human trafficking. Well, you know what? This has been a problem for a long time, but now it's affecting all different cultures or say races. Now it's a big problem. Yes. So a lot of times we look back when I look at with, Af with we look back at slavery times, you know, look at look at with, with African-Americans, you know, with us being, you know, enslaved, going back to slavery. We had the house Negroes and the porch Negroes, and we had the field Negroes, okay? So then when we were back enslaved, look at how many of the, 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 the slaves got preg impregnated by the, the master, right? So then let's look at how many, how many, let's say people wanna have sex with a black person. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's say a Caucasian male. Oh, he's going ahead, he has a perfect life. He may be an executive of a big company, but on the side, guess what he's doing? He's not, he's telling his wife, or whatever. Oh, I'm going out with the fellas tonight for some drinks or whatever. Or I have this, you know, uh, this meeting I got to be at. No, they're hooking up with a trafficker because they're the Johns, John or Johns. They hooking up with that trafficker. And next thing is, I want, I want a young black girl. or I want a black, a black one. But you could, never know, you know. Could you, could you explain to the person who is watching who is the John? The John is the person that's going to be serviced. That the that the victim's going to service. They're the one that the trafficker is going to. Uh, is going to receive payment for in exchange for that victim um, services. Okay, so that's a language so you can learn a little bit who is watching this. So mm -hmm. no, you are teaching, oh, you are teaching so much. And the, I just had an idea. Huh? I was going to say something. Yeah. So remember I said 43% of the, the traffickers also you got to look at as women too, right? So then when you look at that, don't think that it's just Johns that are males that want to that want to be serviced, right? Females. When you look at traffickers, it's like a smorgasbord, like a Burger King. You can have it your way, you know. Where you know that 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 analogy where you got um you got you you want a little girl? What well, what age range do you want? What color? You want a little boy? There's women that like little boys, right? There's women that like little girls. There's men that like little girls, and there's men that like little girls because that's why you got to realize that. There's males that are tra involved in trafficking too. Yes. Little boys, look at the average age, uh, I believe 11 to 13, you know, uh, average age of entry, average age of range of entry into labor trafficking, males, you're looking at 11 to 13 years old. Yeah, I was listening, I was uh, reading about and saying the number of, the increased number of uh, boys being trafficked. Mm -hmm. And but people all, don't talk about that. They don't talk about no, that. No, and look at the traffickers do. They use those young recruits to also, their position is to be, to be a recruiter. So they're going to recruit other young girls and females into the life of trafficking for that trafficker. Yes. Right. No, so yeah. you, this is a big business. You know, this, you got a marketing department, basically, you know, you have, you know, your recruiters, you know, you got different, this is different levels to this, to this big criminal industry known as human trafficking. We were talking about how you do your training. I really love how your training is, how you structure your training. And I just had an idea that after we can talk about that, how you can reach, because I was reading this report by the, I was reading this report saying the number, especially with COVID now, the number, the increased number of victims of human, of children. And you are saying like, especially like during COVID, a lot of the number of 
uh, violence at home increased and sometimes I, a child instead of seeking the help of the parent because the parents are all there all the time there sometimes they don't feel confident to share their stories with the parents they end up seeking for someone to talk on the internet and consequently the case the number of cases increased of being people being children being uh, trapped starting from home so um, we need to change, I think, in my opinion, how we talk about human trafficking, especially in schools. And that's why I'm connected. I'm connected here because I'm in education. So how we can teach our children or teenagers about human trafficking? Without, because sometimes I feel that this how it's taught is so we, like I love because you create stories. You are creating stories, and I, I think we should create like theater, like with sharing, like creating strategies to use the theater to teach children to to learn about human trafficking, but using their daily lives. So how we educators can improve, can do a better job helping their students in the classroom and recognize when is a student is is a victim of human trafficking. Okay, so I trained almost 200 uh, school officials during before COVID. Okay, and they, you know, there was truancy officers I trained, counselors, assistant principals, principals, lots of school officials in, in um, the state of Ohio in the Elyria uh, School District. Okay, before right before COVID. So then, what we were supposed to do is after COVID, look at training the children. Okay, when you when we train these kids, we want to look at training the the student. We want to look at after they receive that. Uh, sex education class, all right? So look like what, fifth and sixth grade that we start training on human trafficking, all right? When we, actually, in all my staff, I have kids, youth, ages 11 and up that are on my staff that help infiltrate in and out of the role plays that I go in when we do in person. So I've trained them, all right? And some of them have been involved in the juvenile justice system. And what got me was, how come you've been involved in the juvenile justice system? Where's the criteria, risk factors and stuff that she checked off with? It's this kid right here, commit, the offenses that they're committing, well, we recognize them as high risk, low risk for, for trafficking, okay? So with it, you want to train the, the, the you want to train the, the, the teachers, especially because the kids come to school, the truancy officers, if that kid is missing a lot of school and stuff, you need to go and do a little bit further investigation. You want to look at the parents. Do, are they aware of this kid once they go through the front door of the school? They're going out the back door, let's say skipping school. Are you aware of this? And then, or are you just telling, sitting in letters saying they're sick? We need to interview that kid because that parent could be trafficking that kid. So they're working all night servicing John's and they can't get up in, in time for school, or they've been injured, you know what I mean, some kind of way. And so there's needs to be further investigation. The children need to be trained so that they can understand what human trafficking is and the events, which we hope and pray doesn't happen to them, how to get themselves out of it, get themselves some help, you know, and how to recognize when they're using these social media. What, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I am. You, 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 uh, oh my gosh, what are you saying, saying now is so powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they want to make sure that with it, that these kids are trained and how, you know, they know how, when they're, especially when they're playing these social, on these social media sites, you know, they're, they're, they're adding friends that they don't even know that those are really people saying, you know, the right people that they know those people. And then when they add those friends, they're adding friends because you want to have um, the more people you have on your friends, when you post with your status, the more increase with likes that you want to have. Right. So that's making you popular, you know, and things. Also on like uh, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and stuff. Do these kids know who they're actually these people who they're actually fr uh, accepting firm requests from? And then on these PS4 games, I'm not saying not to buy a PS4 game, but you better know, you better train your kid, or you better recognize the signs of human trafficking, and you need to recognize and teach your kid. Do not be telling any information as far as the housing composition, who you reside with, or any identifying information when you're playing with people. Don't tell any information. If someone starts asking you questions like that, you get off the game with them and stop playing. And you only need to be playing with people that you know, family and friends. Don't be playing with these outside people. Because like I said, everybody's not playing the game for the sake of playing. Those pedophiles are playing for the sake of separation, separating those kids from their families. So that's some of the things that needs to be that needs to be taught and trained with these kids in these school systems. And then also when you look at too, like in one of my role plays, like I said, I have a count, there's a counselor who I play the role of a counselor. I have a, ju a, a juvenile who's in, in school, I play the school counselor who's in love with this guy. 
okay and it's her boyfriend he's older than her she's she found him on facebook he is who he he was who he said he was he was older and she's meeting up with him after school she's called an std all right her mom and them her grades have plummeted they're having problems with her so they vetted or outsourced had a a, a a counselor come and talk to her and then outside of school and then you know the school counselor talking so then this girl is in love she's caused some offenses also in the in the justice system she's in love with her trafficker how do you separate that young lady from him and then letting her know that you know she's she's like giving us some identify identifying information that she's going to a hotel or motels or houses with him and then there's other girls that's brought in and she's you know having sex with his with so-called his friends but she realizes there's a money exchange and drugs but doesn't realize you're a victim of human trafficking he is trafficking you so then she's got that trauma bond she loves him She's not going to separate from him. We look at the case. If you Google, there was a Houston teen committed uh, suicide in Houston, Texas, right? At, uh, Houston teen commits suicide uh, in Houston, Texas uh, after being trafficked. And one of the articles you read, the family said that it was because they think she committed suicide because she couldn't be with her trafficker. So think about what it, how, did the, how that affects the trauma of that child. Right. So think about what their development, psychological development as they move forward in life. They got to deal with this trauma. You got to teach them healthy versus unhealthy relationships. Yes. And you got to let them identify that this man didn't love you. He sold you. How do you get that and then have them to continue on with their life? And then so that they don't fall victim even more further with another trafficker. You get what I'm saying later no. on. And then also with the drug addiction or alcohol addiction or whatever, how to get treated with that, because you don't want something to numb that pain. You know, that's just like a woman finding out, let's say, I'm just giving an example that her husband's cheating on her or a boyfriend. Like what? You go in shock. Like, hold on. This man trafficked me. Well, let me look up what trafficking. He was selling me. He got paid. He didn't love me. Oh, and there was other girls. Oh, what do I do? That's trauma. You got to yeah. affect, you got to deal with all that, you know? And yeah. then for me, I have vulnerability because my dad never told me how beautiful and smart I was. So it was easy for guys in my relationships in my life. They tell me how beautiful and smart I was, but for the wrong reasons. I know what you are saying is so powerful because sometimes this is a generational thing and, mm -hmm. and how we also need to break because talking about human trafficking is still a taboo and how you talk to parents about human trafficking, because just like you're saying in other cases of, children who did what they didn't receive at home and they're gonna look somewhere else so how we also can teach parents but in a way that they can not in a, in a in a way that can really touch parents in their heart and say like look you need to talk to your child about human trafficking about sex about those things but in a way that and also how you treat your children because a lot of your actions now can reflect in your child in the future Correct. And then let's look at uh, two children's service agencies, right? You but they need to know how to identify a victim of human trafficking, one of those kids, possibly youth, and um, you know, how to get them on their road to recovery. And then think about some of these children that's coming from dysfunctional families and everything's happening and they get brought into child protective services. Then they go to the foster care, right? Foster homes. Those foster care parents need to be trained on human trafficking awareness to protect that youth, right? But also with that, before you close that case, the children's services workers, before you start that case, you should have already, when that, when you start that case, have a actual therapist involved in that child, in that youth's life. So that during that case, when you close that case, you make that therapist continues long-term to make sure that the therapeutic relationship or the bond is made between that new foster parent and that youth or foster parents and that youth, right? So that it can decrease the vulnerability of that child running away. And when that child runs away, they may run into what? Opportunist, a trafficker, right? Mm -hmm. And when we look at too, another thing that we see people are complaining about is that you have lot, say you say you have you, Michelle, you're you you're a runaway. We know you always run away. But then here's me, my parent report that uh, you know, I'm missing. This is the first time. The law enforcement's first gonna the first priority is gonna be me. This has never happened to me before. Yeah. What that runaway, oh, she's gonna come back, she's run away. No, you need to be putting focus on both cases. Yes. You know, and that runaway, the parent, you know, if that therapeutic bond isn't made with that foster parent, like I said, that child is gonna go run into the wrong arms. Yes. So you yes. make sure with that, and we gotta make sure with the, the proper diagnosis of disorders, because some children have, you know, problems with attachment, you know, disorders. So then, you know, some of them are looking, they're emotionally abused and they're looking for someone to love them. So then 
they go into a dysfunctional with the foster parents or whatever, then their needs aren't met. They run away. The trafficker has all their needs that's being met. And guess what? They went from the skillet to the fire. Yeah. Got it. I, I remember you were talking. I know you need to go. Um, you were talking about, um, you talk about, the, I remember when during your conversation in the past, you were talking about children with disability. You, you, could you share a little bit more about that? Because um, I remember you were talking, remember when I'm talking on the phone yeah. all day? Yeah. So think about some, um, I've worked with MRDD um, uh, or with low co- individuals with low cognitive behavioral, excuse me, low, you know, colo- low cognitive uh, scores, right? So I don't want to use the word mentally retarded. I would say mentally challenged. Yeah. All right. So some of them in group homes, they get visitor passes, not visitor passes, but they get to go away. Let's say for the weekend somewhere, it could go with their said boyfriend or something. They live in a group home or with their family members or something. You want to make sure with them as well, because they have a disability mentally challenged that they're being placed in the right hands, you know, with the right, with the right person when they go on this weekend passes, because they could be at a mall, you know, shopping or so, oh, you're going to give her a pass to go to the mall or whatever and have, you know, fun, give her some free time, to, you know, in the community. But you want to make sure that you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that person is, is accompanied with someone else. Because a trafficker would prey on that mentally challenged individual with that disability. All right. So you want to make sure that the, the children who are disabled, they, they're protected. Just like we make sure that with registered sex offenders, they can't come close to a school or a place where you have uh, people that are mentally challenged, being, you know, work, you know, their workshops and stuff. You know, you want to keep them safe. So you want to, people who are running group homes and stuff, you want to make sure those mentally challenged or the higher functioning ones that are able to go out on their own, you got to make sure they're being accompanied. Yeah. Because the traffickers are opportunists. Another thing, like we talk a lot about in your task force that is in your organization, the Global Alliance, that I'm going to put the link in your video so people can get to know more about the Global Alliance. We have every month we have meetings and we talk about how to change the culture of how people see human trafficking and how the importance of also changing how at home, how you watch, for example, how, for example, how you watch movies, how you watch documentaries, all know how you watch and advertisement how normalize um the normalization of sex trafficking sometimes in a well, way or where people they don't see anymore as a, a trafficking they see oh that's small one more case one little girl she's having a, a, a boyfriend who is 10 years old 20 years older than her and he's selling it's just like normalize how we need to change how also how parents and especially fathers how they watch with their um and mothers too how they they while they watch at home they can also reflect in porno all that, all that stuff so how you we can change the the how boys and how parents they watch how they watch movies or whatever with their children yeah and you know when we, I, I was looking at some research somewhere and i'll get it for you where they said that two males sitting um i was looking at the research two males sitting um watching a porn together a pornography film together they're twice as likely to become your next trafficker so you want to look at some sex sales, right? So then you want to also look at this too, um, Michelle, how do we prevent the next trafficker? Because when we look at traffickers, a lot of times we're looking at psychological, they have narcissistic personality traits, right? Some of them, well, a lot of them. Okay, let's just say, we're gonna look at that. So we want to look at risk factors of, of the next child, you know, how do we prevent the next trafficker? You know, a, a kid who's grown up where their parents are involved in sex trafficking, they're trafficking them, or they seen the mom and dad bring in the women, you know what I mean? And seeing the Johns being serviced, they're the traffickers, the parents, they seen this, this is a learned behavior. So guess what? Next thing you know, they're, the parents are introducing them to the game, like a business. Let's keep this going. So how do we prevent the next trafficker? But then also, we also have to study the, the, the mindset of a trafficker. What is the mindset of a trafficker psychologically? So we know those that we know what's going on inside a lot of times with the psychological effect, psychological psychology of the trafficker. So that's going to help us to be on the other side defending against human trafficking. Does that make sense? Yeah, make all sense. Yeah, I think I know. Um... Our time is over, but um, you have so much to teach, and I just I wish you the best in your trainings because we need to talk later because I just had an idea in my head here. Yeah. But um, I think you have so much to teach, and people need to get to know your work, and they you you have so much to contribute not only with your life experience but all your knowledge in combining everything what you already did and is talking into people and those I just love how you are training people and please uh 
I just wish you the best. And could you give um, how we just give you a final word, like about how we can improve our system and how we can do a better job of helping the victims and when how to recognize. Could you give your is your last like you is with you like what what you want to share that's that you see that's a gap and we need to work together to improve this gap to change yeah that gap. um we can say that to help with victims of human trafficking with uh providing the education part you make sure that you have people that actually need to test out on their knowledge of human trafficking like organizations the people go through a training program who are going to be giving education out representing their organizations okay they need to be trained they need to be kept you know do even more further continuing education what's going on keep up what's going on with human trafficking because like with us on the global task force we recognize that that human that human trafficking is looking a lot different po uh post covid post covid, right? post -COVID. Yes. So we want to educate the educators the people who are going out giving organizations make sure they're trained and educated because if you have a person like me come through to your training or your not say training your presentation you don't want to deal with me, trust me, because I'm going to take you to class and I'm going to take you to class in front of the actual attendees. And I'm not going to say it, but indirectly, they're going to see that you're a fraud. That doesn't look good for you or your organization. And it doesn't, it's not going to look good with me going after uh, trying to tell, see who your funder is to go ahead and have them bring you to the table with me and get to cut this funding. So you don't want that to happen. Right, because we're in the business of saving lives. So you gotta make sure the education is, is, is secured with the people who are, who are providing that. With the, save, with the services with victims of human trafficking, if you have safe houses and stuff, you wanna make sure that the people are trained with the security to make sure that the victims in there or the survivors, because now they become survivors, they get the proper care and they're secure, not only for if they're, they're involved in an actual investigation involving human trafficking, but also you wanna make sure they're secure so that they don't think, well, I might as well go on back with my trafficker because I'm not as secure in here. I don't have the resources. At least, you know, it'll be a little bit different with him. When really, when they go back to him or her, their trafficker, their lives are even more in danger because they've left. So then the trafficker doesn't trust them. It may kill them. All right. right. It'll be a lot worse. So you want to make sure the right people are servicing victims of human trafficking that are become survivors in those safe houses. And they have the resources that they need with a properly trained um, mental health therapist, you know, chemical dependency counselors and things, you know. And when they're being transported to courts in different places that they have to go to, you want to make sure that they're transported with security. All right. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're trans being transported to a court or to like maybe a family funeral or something, you know, they have security, local law enforcement to, tra to, tra to, to transport them to make sure they're secure before when they leave that safe houses to that place that they're going. And then when they're, when they're going to return back safely. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we want, I want people to know is that you may see a person walking down the street that you see them clothed differently. You know, clothes, you know, may look uh, like they're exposing a lot. Don't judge, be judgmental because that could, that's somebody's loved one, that they're not doing this because they want to, it's because they have to, there's something behind it. And then you also want to also keep in mind that there's actually victims that are being housed in different places. Maybe, and some people I've, I've heard of the stories of being housed in, in, uh, in, in dog cages. They don't see the light of, the light of day. You know what I mean? So this is serious, very, very, this is very, very serious. And so this could be your child or loved one that this happens to. And um, my thing is, is my life is devoted to doing nothing but training and saving people from what happened to me and trying to combat this issue. You know, we can't do this alone. We need other people. Use your gifts. I look at Michelle, what you're doing, your gifts to help in the fight. If you're a photographer, go and take pictures at an event, possibly of discussions or something, or, you know, people who are providing awareness, you know, out there, put that out there. If you're a graphic designer, go and work for a, you know, try to help on the side if you want to, a company that's combating human trafficking, help that, help that owner of the company or the nonprofit to continue to get the, the, the message out there. If you're a therapist, learn how can you specify with victims of human trafficking, what training do you need, you know? So we can, and then if you're a police officer, make sure you're properly trained, you know? Whenever you, when, whenever you go outside, pay attention to your surroundings, teach your kid to pay attention to their surroundings. And if they're not, and if the kids aren't trained or the, their parents, look out for them. Uh, you know what I mean? Even though their parents aren't, you look out for you to be their eyes and ears too. So that's basically, you know, things that you need to be paying attention to. And if you want to contact me, would you like me to give the contact information, Michelle? Yes. And on the, under your our video, is going to have yeah. also all your contacts and your emails so people can reach you, how to do the training, how you yeah. can come and 
and do training in their school, in their organizations, in the church or? Yeah, wherever, you know, um, it's trafficked. You spell it trafficked, T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K-E-D-L-I-V-E-S-M-A-T-T-E-R-H-A-N-D-N-H-A-N-D at gmail.com. So it all together, traffic lives matter hand in hand. Yeah. Your hand wow. and, I'll, and I'll take your hand and we're going to combat human trafficking. No, we are, I'm going to put all your links on information so people can reach you because you have so much to teach. You have a lot to teach and there is a need for that. And mm -hmm. the, your experience, like you were there and we need to stop listening to people who is just like, people who really, activists who really lived and they, they experience and they know how is the system works because they were there and they lived that. They have the, yeah. they lived the experience. Yep. And one last thing I'm going to say that I didn't share is I'm That's also good. a former chief civil rights investigator. Human trafficking is a violation to civil rights, people, individuals, their civil rights, their right to freedom, you know, and I just want to be able to free more people. Um, have you heard back with Harriet Tubman? She said that I would have freed many more slaves had they known they were slaves. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. And uh, thank you. You sh that was amazing. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>